Hi everyone. Hello and welcome to this webinar. I'm Joella, account manager at Walkup, and I'm delighted to be here today. I hope you've had a nice week so far, that it started and it's not been too much of a chaotic start for this week. Um, we'll just a couple of moments uh, for everyone to arrive, and then we'll get started in just a couple of moments. There you go, I think we can take it from here. <laughs> Anyhow, so lovely being here today with everyone. Today's agenda, what are we gonna talk about? Today, we're going to start off by talking about how students learn best according to science. We're gonna highlight some interesting studies and cognitive science theories. Focus number two, will be on practical topics, or practical insights and tips that you can easily use and apply to your courses to improve your students' learning. And then we're going to have a little Q&A session at the end. Now, before we start, I have two disclaimers. Number one, you'll be using your smartphones during the session, so keep them at hand if they're not already ready. Disclaimer number two, I'm going to reference scientific studies about cognitive science in this presentation. I'm going to give you tips on how to improve your students' learning, but I'm not a teacher nor a neuroscientist. However, at WalkLab, we work with both so that we have a chance to get their insights and share their best practices. And of course, I will provide you with all the references to these studies so that you can dig deeper in your own time if you wish. There you go. So, dearest audience, now that we are all warmed up, let's get started and take a peek into the mysterious world of cognitive science. Since the mid 1950s, cognitive science has sought to understand how the human brain acquires uses and transmits knowledge. One particular researcher, Stanislas Dehn, was a professor at the Collège de France, and he was a cognitive psychologist, but also a prominent representative of um, his discipline. And he highlighted four main contributions to the learning process. He called those four elements the four pillars of learning. Your question, what are these pillars? Number one pillar is attention. One cannot learn without paying attention. In practice, this means two things. First of all, the teacher must draw attention and maintain the student's attention. And number two, students must pay attention as well. But here's where it's tricky. Attention is selective. It acts as a filter which catches bits of information here and there and lets others slip through. If you're not convinced, you can see for yourself. Here, let's take this test of following selective attention test. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> this video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from VizCog Productions. There you go. So Learn more at the end. 
sorry. So there you go. You saw um, that attention is selective. Now that means that if teachers want to convey an important piece of information, they have to repeat it over and over again because of the selectivity of attention. Pillar number two is active engagement. If one wants to remember new information, passively listening to the professor is insufficient. And this has been scientifically proven. A scientist, a study by Zerum and Rodinger in 2020 explains this concept pretty well. And in the study, you have three groups of students who were asked to prepare for a test using three different techniques. Group A had four study periods. And by study periods, we mean reading, highlighting, etc. And they had four test trials. And by test trials, we mean mock exams or when they were asked questions or when they were asked to recover the learning materials. Group B had six study trials and two test trials. And group C had only eight study trials. Who do you think performed best? As a matter of fact, group one performed best. But as it happens, group one also had the most test trials. In fact, the most active way, the most effective way to learn is to actively practice remembering knowledge. And in most educational situations, there is a sharp distinction between the learning process and the assessment moment. Learning is commonly interpreted as the moment when students read their books or review their notes, whereas the assessment process is commonly assimilated to taking quizzes and tests. Teachers and students usually think that tests are like dipsticks that you just drop into the student's brain every so often to measure what they've learnt. But in fact, tests are efficient within the learning process because they activate the brain. So there you go, that's for pillar number two. Pillar number three, measuring and understanding the level of a comprehension and giving feedback. Though this is not a new discovery, Professor Dane sheds light on the process that takes place within the brain when you give feedback. The learner makes a prediction. If the prediction is correct, the knowledge is better anchored. If it isn't, it causes a discrepancy between the knowledge, the prediction, and reality, which leads to a new prediction being made. And the successful adjustments of those predictions favour the learning process. And last but not least on our list of pillars is consolidation. Memorising information is only but the first step. Knowledge must be consolidated if it is to be durable in time. And this, again, has been scientifically proven. We're going to talk about Hermann Ebbinghaus, who theorised this in the 19th century, with the forgetting curve. Basically, the forgetting curve is a mathematical formula that describes the rate at which something is forgotten after it's been initially learnt. And the downward slope can be softened by repeating the learned information at particular intervals. And this curve shows how information is lost over time, when there is no attempt to retain it, or when there is an attempt to retain it. So there you go, my dearest audience. These are the four pillars of learning by Stanislas Dane. Now you must be wondering, okay, but this is nice, but how does it fit into my courses? We're getting there. We're going to discover a few tips and tricks for you to grip your students' attention, get them engaged, help them recall and consolidate what you're teaching. Let's go. Tip number one. Tip number one will help you get your students at ease and consequently help you get their attention. Use icebreakers. An icebreaker is an activity designed to welcome attendees or warm up conversation. Any event that requires interaction between people is an occasion for an icebreaker. And you can use, you can be really creative with the icebreakers you choose. You could ask um, questions such as, um, how would you describe yourself in one word? Or if you were an animal, what would it be? But you can also choose more engaging um, 
icebreakers such as show me a yellow object or and this also works remotely via the camera via the webcam show me the ugliest object in your house maybe so icebreakers are really there to just get everyone at ease so they are then more attentive to what you're saying next tip on our list tip number two this one works towards getting your students attention arouse curiosity my dearest audience when starting a new chapter for example you can ask your students what they know about the topic you're going to broach and just like that you get conversation going now as it happens wall club is a fantastic tool to accomplish this thanks to its word cloud option this option enables you to get a snapshot of what your audience is thinking. Let's give it a try. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to take your phone and connect to the event we've prepared for you. You can connect using two methods. Number one, you can scan the QR code on the screen. Number two, you can enter the link that you can see on the screen that my colleagues also put in the chat and connect to the event. So two ways of connecting to an event, either scanning a QR code or by pasting, copying and pasting this link in an internet tab on any internet connected device. Now it can be a phone, it can be a computer, it can be a tablet, so as long as it's internet connected. And you might notice a number at the bottom of the screen, 31, 32, 33, 35. Those are the people connecting to the event. So I know how many people are logged on, logged into the event. So give you a couple more seconds to connect, and then we're gonna go get the first question rolling. Okie doke, I can see the number still increasing, giving you a few more moments, and then we'll get going. Fantastic. Seems like the number stabilized at 50. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm arousing your curiosity. What do you think the next tip will be? Or what do you think one of the tips we'll mention will be? What do you think will be the next tip? And what you can see coming up is a word cloud. It's a snapshot of what you, my dearest audience, are thinking. And I can see the responses coming in quite fast, actually. How to keep them engaged, images, fun, neuroscience, um, retention, teaser fun. I like that one. Multiple choice, um, jokes, yes. <laughs> jokes, um, asking questions, very true engagement, question types. So as you can see, all of this is appearing before your eyes. And you might notice that some words, for example, the word fun, appear bigger than others. That means that more people in the audience answered the word fun. <laughs> Reptilians, okay. Um, so there you go. So we've got quite a few interesting um, and interesting selections here, interesting ideas. So how about we move on um, to the next tip? So that way you'll see who got it, who, who, who foresaw what we're going to talk about next. Okay, next tip is punctuating your courses with wake up calls. Now to understand this, you need to take a step back and see what science says. Cognitive research estimates the human attention span to be quite short. So that means that after a short amount of time, attention just wanders off. That's why it's necessary to punctuate your course with wake up calls, with wake up activities to just get your students' attention back on track. And having said that, I'm going to move on directly to tip four because it is the logical continuation of tip three. Punctuating courses with activities is important, but punctuating courses with diverse activities is 
paramount so as not to create a linear repetitive pattern within your courses. And here you can be creative. Quotes, jokes, guessing games, call and responses, label on image, you name it. You can really be creative in the type of wake up calls you prepare for your students. Now, as a matter of fact, Wool Club offers a proof to be quite an efficient tool in that respect because the platform offers more than 15 different types of questions that you can use to interact with your students. So you're very flexible in the type of content you can create. To give you an idea, let's give it a try. Coming up, back to your phones, here's a question for you. If maybe you're a maths teacher, you can ask your students questions, mathematical questions. Um, so let's see who out of uh, the audience is maybe a math teacher or has um, memories or distant painful memories of their maths courses in uni or in, 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 in I don't know, in university. Um, let's see who's, who's a, a maths person deep down. Uh, so there is a vast majority for 2x being the derivative of x squared. Well, as a matter of fact, it is. Question one is the correct answer. So it seems like we've got quite a few, quite a few math connoisseurs here in the audience. So bravo. So there you go. That's an example if you're a math teacher, maybe, or a physics teacher. If you're a literature teacher, for example, you could use fill in the blank questions as punctual wake up calls. Here I'm asking you to fill in the text with the name of the author. So who wrote Hamlet? I'll give you a few more seconds before we reveal the answers. Yep, the most frequent answers. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, you. <laughs> no, I didn't write um I didn't write Hamlet. Shakespeare, there you go. So mostly everyone got it right. There you go. So this is another type of question that you can create to interact with your audience. For maybe you're a history teacher and you want to ask your students how um, the chronological order of certain events, this is possible thanks to sorting questions. And what we're asking you here is to give the correct order, the chronological order of these events. There you go. So you have to use the arrows on the side of your screen, on your phone, and then um, recreate the chronological order of these uh, historical periods. So let's take a sneak peek at the answers, at the most frequent answers. So prehistory, Middle Ages, Renaissance, modern history, there's a vast majority for this order. Prehistory, Middle Ages, modern history, Renaissance, and two people for modern history, Renaissance, Middle Ages, prehistory. Now, you might have noticed this little tick button, which shows the correct answer. And the correct combination was prehistory, Middle Ages, Renaissance, and then modern history. So there you go. So we've just seen three different types of questions that you can create depending on whether you're, uh, well, depending on the subject you teach. So there you go. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, to the next tip. Tip number five. This tip will help you foster your students' active engagement. Use anonymity when it's possible. Here, when using audience response systems, please do not underestimate the power of anonymity. And here I would like to directly quote one of our partners at WallClub, who is Justin Staunton, a learning technologist from Hibernia College in Ireland, who said something very interesting. You don't want to capture people's names. You want to capture their thoughts. And interactions. The reason behind this is when students speak anonymously there is a real liberation of speech. 
this allows students to contribute to the lecture without the fear of public speaking. It gives tutors a very clear insight into the mind of the learners. So there you go. They are able to express themselves in a way that they wouldn't have out loud. There you go. So that's for tip number five. When it's possible, privilege anonymous participation. Moving on to tip number six. Now this one speaks for itself in a way. Gamification of courses tends to increase the appeal of learning activities. And here I'm thinking directly of the people who answered fun in the word cloud, yes. Gamification increases the fun, increases innovation, increases productivity, which in turn will increase the ability to retain knowledge. And here you can be very creative in the type of gamifications you'll opt for. So say for example, um, we want to measure the height of a building, and this is a physics experiment. You could ask your students to come up with as many methods as possible to measure the height of that building whether they be plausible, feasible or not, and then hand out an award um, for the people, the group who has the most methods, or the group who finds um, the most innovative methods, or the group who finds the least feasible methods, maybe. So you can really just get that creativity going. Another idea would be creating pedagogical escape games or puzzles instead of giving them a problem, add a bit of spice to it by adding twists and turns and questions and puzzles for them to solve. In a nutshell, you will have guessed that gamification and competition increase engagement. Is that extra spice, that extra flavor to your course. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on to tip number seven which is a direct recall of the fourth pillar of education, which was consolidation. Here we're talking about activating your student's brain. And you must be thinking, what are you talking about? Regular brain activation, regular memory activation, how do you obtain that? By getting your students to recall their study material by asking them questions, because that forces them to retrieve the information that's encoded in the neurons. By getting them to practice spaced repetition. So as opposed to them cramming everything in their heads five hours before the test or the day before the test, get them to practice spaced repetition. So during a week, get them to work less but more regularly spaced repetition will help a better anchoring of information within their minds. So there you go. That's for tip number seven, regularly activating your students' brains. And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, collect feedback. And this is, again, a direct recall of one of the pillars of education or one of the pillars of learning of Stanislas Dane, getting feedback. It's a secret for nobody that we are all in uncharted territory. Um, we've been uprooted and thrusted into this digitized world and we're forced to adapt. And I wish I could say I had the magic recipe, but unfortunately I don't. And as a matter of fact, no one does. So we have to experiment, we have to iterate. Think of it as an empirical process um, and to know whether what you've implemented is efficient, you need feedback. So don't forget to regularly ask your students for feedback on how you've adapted, strive for continuous improvement. So there you go. Those are the eight tips that we have for you to improve your students learning. Now I'd like to take a few moments um, to recap 
um, what's been said, but mostly before that, answer a couple of questions. Please feel free to jot down any questions via Wallclap. So you can take your phones and there is an icon at the bottom of the screen, a green icon at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to jot down any questions in the message tab. So this is an interaction, a way for us to interact if you have any questions. So I can see a question in the chat. Hi Anna, how do you get feedback? Well, for example, um, you can get feedback by simply sending a form, for example, or by using a WallClap word cloud, like we showed you earlier on, and asking your students, what did you think about this and that method we've implemented? Or you could think of um, asking them to um, evaluate on a scale of one to five, what do you think of this new method that we've tried to implement? What do you think, how would you rate? Um, so this could be a couple of ways to ask for feedback. So I'm sharing my screen with you uh, so you can see the questions coming in. Oh, so there's quite a few coming in. Brainstorming question, are brainstorming questions useful for feedback? Yes, they are. Brainstorming questions enable you to um, brainstorm on what's been done, what worked, what needs improving. And that way you can build from what's been done and the suggestions from your audience. Maybe another question. Um, how to use WooClap for spaced repetition? Now, indeed, WooClap is was designed for live interaction. Uh, so preferably used for a live context. However, and here's where it's interesting, um, we have another platform which is called Wolf Flash which uh, proves efficient for regular revision learning. So this platform is for pedagogical follow-up at home. You'll use WallClap in class live and revision, spaced repetition, personalized revision program at home. Moving on to another question. Um, how can you write mathematical formulas in WallClap's questions? Oh, so those are a few tips and tricks. Um, and if you want, maybe we can send you um, articles about that. Um, so it's just a matter of adding a few symbols before what you actually want to write. Um, can I try and get a few other questions here? Uh, oh, there are quite a few questions about WallClap and WallFlash. Um, so can we use WallClap and WallFlash together? WallClap and WallFlash are complementary. So the ideal scenario is, in class, you use WallClap for live interaction with your students. And then you prepare content for them on WallFlash that they can then use to revise at home at their own pace. And the advantage is that WallFlash was really designed for that personalized revision process. Um, moving on to a couple of questions, maybe I have I missed any. Um, how to give personalized feedback to individual persons um, in the participant pace mode. Um, so you can give feedback to, individ to individuals by sending them a personalized report. Um, now, if you're using apps, sometimes the apps have this option, for example, WallClap does, or you could yourself, depending on the size of your audience, um, generate automatic reports, um, depending on what your students answered, um, depending on what the content they submitted. Um, oh, here's an interesting one that I missed. What kind of icebreakers can you do with WallClap? Oh, I like that one. Um, so this is quite an interesting one. So, for example, using a find on image, this is one we like to use within the company, um, is find on image um, which, uh, which person, which um, sports do you most identify with? Or how do you feel today? And 
having different emojis or different states of emotion and asking your audience how they feel today. Or what kind of icebreakers um, you could think of, word clouds, um, how was your weekend or how was your week or any type of uh, questions you could imagine um, on a wall cloud, wall, sorry, wall clap or word cloud. Um, okay, so what am I missing? Does wall clap work asynchronously as well? So yes, it does. In wall clap, there is a, an asynchronous mode, so a participant pace mode. However, wall clap, um, was not specifically designed for participant pace modes, for um, revision modes, whereas Wall Flash is. And Wall Flash really has those scientific studies behind it. Wall Flash really offers that personalized revision process depending on the student's learning speed and the student's learning um, uh, process evolution. Um, what else am I missing? Um, how to evaluate the answers? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, so is this related to um, Wall Clap specifically or any other tools or evaluating answers in general? Feel free to write uh, in the chat or actually just unmute your microphone uh, to, to, so we can better understand and elucidate this question. The way I understand this question, how to evaluate um, your how to evaluate answers, um, I would speak for all clap specifically. Depending on the types of questions you create, there are some questions which have a correct answer, um, such as the sorting question that we did earlier on. Some others don't. For example, the word all clap word cloud. And depending on the type of question, if there is a set correct answer or not then you directly have what, uh, how to evaluate your, your audience. Um, dum, 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 dum. So what am I missing? How to use WallClap for space repetition? Um, WallClap, no, not for space repetition. That would be WallFlash. Do you support latex? Yes. Asimat? Yes. Um, evaluate in WallClap in order to give personalized feedback. So I think I understand here. WallClap does indeed um, give you the option of sending a personalized report. How well would WallClap work for a large audience of 100 people, for example? Yes, well, WallClap works for an audience um, of 100 people in the same way that it would work with an audience of 200, 300, up to 1,000 people. Um, so I, think, I see these questions are quite wall clap orientated. Um, what am I missing? Shakespeare, okay. <laughs> um, hi, is it possible to get a free, sorry, to get three free slides with activity instead of two? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand that. So again, feel free to, to, to help me understand what you mean by here, what you mean here. Um, I think I understand what you mean. Is it free to get in the free version? Is it free to get um, more than two free questions? I think that's the answer, or at least that's how I understand it. Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, but you're kind of, this is a, uh, a glimpse to what we'll be talking about in a few moments, um, how to contact us to use WallClap uh, in a more optimized manner. Um, so I'll get back to that later. Um, I saw a question that I quite like. Do you have an example of engaging activity for language learning? So for example, um, engaging an activity for language learning would be um, 
you could think of asking your 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 students um, one word in the language they are learning to describe um, their week or their emotional state and or on a specific vocabulary topic so if you're teaching them um, uh, vocabulary such as uh, emotional states I'm happy I'm sad you could then ask them um, to give you with a word cloud for example how you feel in the other language to answer this question um, what else am I missing how to give personalized feedback how do you integrate walk up in presentations? So there's there are two ways of integrating walk up in presentations. Um, either you can upload presentations on the walk up and directly embed your questions within the presentation, or it works the other way around. You call walk up into your presentation, and as a matter of fact, that's what I did for this webinar. I had my Google slide presentation and I directly embedded the questions within the presentation. So it works both ways. Um, can you get a print of the word cloud or of the answers? Absolutely. In WallClap, there is a possibility of exporting results of exporting results either by giving, uh, getting a specific view of what every student answered to every question or by getting a more general view of what the whole audience answered. And so that's where you'll get the full view of the word cloud, for example. Um, okay, what else are we missing? Dun, 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 dun. As you did the way I did, <laughs> can you export all clap questions? Yes, you can. Um. Is there a possibility of signing up for both WallClap and WallFlash? Yes, there is. So you could just contact us. Again, spoiler alert for the end of the presentation. Um, so yeah, you'll just get, get in contact with us and then we'll just touch base on what it is you feel you want to do and then we will be there um, for you. Um, are there any other questions I'm missing? I think the number of questions has stabilized. Um, yeah, I think it seems the number of questions has stabilized. Oh, does WallClap support HTML files? Um, I'd rather get back to you on that one. Um, okay, don't tell me we've got a couple more moments. Um, before before the this webinar get, comes to an end, um, are there any questions maybe that I'm missing in the chat? Well, it seems not. So. It's been, so just to conclude, nope, give me one moment and I'll be with you showing my screen again. <laughs> so to conclude, what have we spoken about today? Well, we spoke about a lot. First of all, we took a tour of science and what science has to say about um, the four pillars of learning and how each pillar has been scientifically proven. 
And then next up on the list was eight tips that you can use to improve your students' learning. Now, as you noticed, we mentioned wall clap in some of our tips, but actually wall clap applies to all of them. So if you're interested to learn more about the platform and its features and wall clap and wall flash, you can try it for free and you can contact us and my colleagues will send you the links in the chat. And then I guess now this webinar is coming to an end. So I really do hope you enjoyed the moment we spent together and yet you found it useful. I really enjoyed this webinar. So please don't hesitate to leave us your feedback directly in the Walk Lab event you participated in. So my colleague uh, will give you access to the asynchronous, very quick questionnaire um, to give us your opinion, to give us your feedback. And thank you again for participating. It was a real pleasure. So I wish you good evening and good night.